History Class 112, The Wild West, California. Remember in the last class I said that California was uh, basically a few Northern Baptist and uh, Catholic. Now, go back another hundred years. We were in 1950s, 1940s. Now we're going to go back to the 1850s in California. Now remember that the Baptists uh, uh, translated themselves into California. They were, uh, let's see here. I wanted to read a little statement, but I can't find it right now. This, uh, This book is precious. It's a history a Southern Baptists don't want today. Because it reminds them of what they one time taught and believed. The, uh, the first missionary Baptist church in California. Baptists came here and they looked upon the Baptists as, as Okies, Arkies, illiterate, dirt people, people that were related to the dirt. And they did all of the hard labor. Marin, you remember, I mean, I was part of it. My family uh, came to California, been mistaken for white Okies, they were Indian. Maryland's family came to California. How long did it take them to get here from Missouri, Maryland? Three days Three on the train. Days. Three days on the train. That was my they, mother's They rode family. a Santa Fe train all the way. My family drove broken down cars that they had to work on all the way, fixed tires all the way to California from Oklahoma, from Paul's Valley, Duncan and Marlowe, etc. They came out of California. Sippy came out here, Sam Paul's sister, and, and settled down in Greenfield on a little farm out there with their daughter. My family came to California to be mistaken. They worked those fields and things. They came to California to be mistaken for the, all the rest of the white Okies that were here. But almost every one of them Okies were part Indian. Mine were almost full blood. Now, they looked down upon these people as uh, lesser than society, the lower class. As stated before, the Southern Baptists were among the first religious leaders come to California about the time the state was admitted to the Union. Now, this is a hundred years before the Okies came to California, but they were coming to California. They came to California to get work in the Dust Bowl. The, the, that's a, the greatest man-made disaster in American history is the Dust Bowl. But this is a hundred years before the Dust Bowl. They came all the way from states back there to come to California for the gold rush. It said up here that uh, the news that gold had discovered in Sutter's Mill soon spread to Texas, Arkansas, Missouri, and points east without end of telegraph, without aid of telegraph, telephone, television, fast trains, or great propulsion. The announcement electrified the nation's capital, though there was not a single incandescent lamp in the city. While Congress was taking time out to heated debates over the slavery question to decide how California ought to be admitted to the Union, whether a slave state or a free state. The main lumberjacks were headed toward taller timber, bigger trees. Kentuckians were leaving their tobacco to anyone who would harvest and smoke it. As they all joined the march to California, Others took their politics so seriously that they wouldn't come to California until it was came to state. Now we're going to come to California. We're going to come to Southern California. Southern California, Los Angeles was not Los Angeles like it is today at all, period. It was all Spanish, all Catholic control, okay? All Catholic control. And the ones that were Catholic were Northern Baptists. They didn't want any intruders here to teach anything other than what they had been propagating. 
As stated before, Southern Baptists were among the first religious leaders to come to California about the time the state was admitted to the Union. For instance, J. Lewis Shuck did work among the uh, Chinese in San Francisco while on his way to China in 1848 and 1849. Mr. Daniel L. Tharp, religion editor of the Los Angeles Times, wrote a story which appeared in July the 15th or July the 5th, 1952 edition of the Times, in which he gave an account of the organization of a Baptist church in El Monte, California, in 1853. Mm. These people brought their letters from wherever. And he went out there and joined among people. They weren't about to go to some Catholic church and kneel down for some priest to ring a bell. According to Mr. Tharp, it all began when Richard Chamberlain Fryer, not yet an ordained minister, marched down the aisle and laid his weather-beaten, brass-bound Bible on the pulpit and then placed his two cold pistols beside it. and said, let us pray. His two strapping sons, each of them a pistol jutting from their belt, sat down in the front row. Why did they carry guns to the pulpit? Why did they carry guns in the church house? Because it was dangerous to preach the gospel. Heads bowed, listening to the words of the prayer and ready for anything that might develop in the process. There were 20 people present for this service which passed peacefully with no notable disturbances. You know why they had no don't notable disturbances? Because they had the right to bear arms. That's why. They had the right to bear arms, but they needed it too. You know, I had contracts out on me and everything else, didn't I, Marilyn? You did too. I carried a gun always to church. Always to church. Because I didn't know when it was going to happen. That's the safest place I felt, but you have to be ready anyway. You're going to be ready or dead, one or the other. Ready or dead. The, surf, surf, the first surfer was held in the little schoolhouse, located in the spot where El Monte's branch of the Bank of America is located in El Monte. That's then. This is in the 1950s now. As you perhaps know, was the end of the Santa Fe Trail. El Monte was the end of the Santa Fe Trail. Hmm. Now, <clears throat> we know the Santa Fe Trail went on down, and then it ran down into Mexico, down into Sonora, or Mexico. Now, getting into another little story now. Joaquin Marietta now. Now, this is the same period of time. Joaquin Marietta was all over this country. Joaquin Marietta was traveling these same trails. Joaquin Marietta, there were five Joaquins. This is the story of Zorro, the real Zorro. Up in Oakland, San Francisco area, his, him and his brothers and mother and wife and all of them had a uh, silver mines up there. And when uh, California was admitted to the state, they took all of their property away from them. And uh, they uh, raped his wife, beat his mother, and beat his brother, or hung his brother, and beat him half to death. He told them, if you better finish killing me, because if you don't, I'm going to hunt down every one of you, and I'm going to hang you behind the horse, dragging you. Well, the first thing he did is he went and tried to get a legal help from the sheriff, the high sheriff of the area, and he said, you have no rights. You have no rights. Your rights were all taken away from you. Well, he began to hunt them all down and drag them and hung them. He drove them. He was a great horseman, a great swordsman, and a pistolier, and a rifleman that unbelievable in that day. His, his family and friends and gang would have six sets of pistols on their across their saddle horns on their saddles. Six sets of pistols, each one of them shooting six times, plus a rifle for long distance. Wherever they went, they had these six pistols on. And they went right down to the San Joaquin Barry and took 300 head of horses, and they took them right down into Cucamonga, 
Rancho Cucamonga, and they'd rest them there for six weeks or so, and then they'd take them all the way to California. But in the middle of doing that, where did they rest their horses, Marilyn? You remember? Yes, in the on side, our place. On our farm. There was a place there where Joaquin Marietta rested his horses for up to six weeks to fatten them up because they took them all the way from Northern California. We all had an artesian well. That was an artesian well there that had that sweet water. All the rest of it was stagnant, just uh, saline water, just not good. But there on the farm was a artesian well. And that's where it's at. So now we're all back in this period of time now. Joaquin Marietta began to rob places and began to kill all the people that killed his family and beat him. Some of them escaped and left the country. Now, El Monte, branch of Bank of America was loaded in El Monte. As you perhaps know, it was the end of the Santa Fe Trail. The Santa Fe Trail ended right there. That's why so many people ended up in Southern California and they spread out from there. They either went on the Oregon Trail north or the Santa Fe Trail south. After Lexica, uh, <clears throat> the end of the Santa Fe Trail in those days was known as Lexicon, no doubt named after Lexicon, Missouri, the hometown of its founder, Captain John Johnson, Rowdies, who threatened to break up the service, failed to put in their appearance in El Monte that day. You know why? Those boys were ready. They were ready for, for the, to go to work. Daddy was up there preaching with two pistols, one on each side of the pulpit, and his big brass-bound Bible, and those two boys sitting with their pistols sticking out of their belts. Gunfighters in church, if they need be. Nevertheless, Evangelist Fryer, who is said to be from Missouri, bolstered his authority with his shooting arms. He bolstered his authority with his shooting arms. Mr. Thar goes on to say that the three Baptists had, had brought the faith of the fathers with them from Missouri, Arkansas, and Texas, and while the records of this early church have disappeared, the names of four charter members are known. They were William Foreman, said to have been the first Baptist pastor in Los Angeles County, Richard Fryer, John Fouquet, and W.H. Pendleton. Services were held in the schoolhouse until 1855 when they acquired a remodeled granary. The upstairs of the building became the Masonic Hall. Every time you had a Baptist church, you had a Masonic Hall. All of you anti-Masonic people out there, your Baptist faith was, was infiltrated by the Masonic Hall. Period. Every missionary Baptist church had a, had a lodge in it. In California? Now, I had pastored Masonic people. Most of them were deacons in Baptist churches. Many of them pastors. I see nothing wrong with them. They talk about all how the devilish it is and everything else. Uh, and I'm not propagating it. I, I had an opportunity to go to Masonic Lodge, and they told me you'll never be great unless you become a Mason. Marilyn's father became a Mason. He became five, vice president of Mobile Oil Company. They opened doors for you. The upstairs of the building became the Masonic Hall while the Baptists used the lower floor. And they were one and the same. Dr. Ben M. Bogart was a Masonic. Dr. Travis Hubbard, his father was a Mason. All of my families down until, my, until the 1950s were Masons. The Sam Paul family, Sam Paul was a Mason. Frederick Tecumseh Waite, the outlaw statesman, the one that fought in the Lincoln County War, was a leader in the Masonic Hall. My great-great-great-grandfather was a Mason. His daughter married Sam Paul. They were all Masons. All Masons. These were Indian Masons, by the way. Fryer is said to be the first pastor preacher ordained in California, had left El Monte in 1857, and John Allen Friedman made his way from Texas by the way of an ox cart, and found the church pastorless, but not for long. He was destined to be its pastor, dividing his time between it 
in the San Bernardino where he organized another church, San Bernardino. Later, Freeman organized churches in Downey, Compton, and Pomona, and Santa Ana, and all of these became missionary Baptist churches. These are the churches that educated me. Before dying in ripe old age of 98, it is said of Freeman that when he and his party started from Texas, they held a council to decide whether to travel on Sundays. Now remember, the Catholic Church had pawned off Sunday as the Sabbath. Baptists fell for it, except for the Seventh-day Baptist. Half of the immigrants decided to halt, and the other went on. By the time they uh, reached Santa Fe, they overtook the Sunday travelers, stalled because their oxen feet were so badly worn and too sore to walk. Remember, the Sabbath was for the animals, too. While most of the work done by these and other pioneers was either perpetuated or allowed to die by Northern Baptists, nevertheless, it should be said that the Southern Baptists are by no means newcomers to California. Early in the 19th century, and I want Kirk, my friend Kirk, I want to school with the, this is his family, Kirk Mauser. Early in the 19th century, a 16-year-old German Baptist boy known as Little Dutch M Mauser landed in New York. He soon married and migrated to Arkansas where his son William Harrison was born and the son was destined to hear the gospel as Baptist preached it and accepted it. He, he was saved, baptized, and called to preach and ordained as the Baptist ministers. Some of his grandchildren who are still living say that in later life he wore a long white flowing beard. And when fully aroused, there are few men of his equal in the pulpit. His Bible kept company with his Winchester during territory days in Oklahoma. Again, the shooting irons and the Bible. Elder Mauser, as he was known in his day, had a son named George, who likewise was a preacher in a considerable ability. Both W.H. and his son George migrated into Oklahoma. That was Indian Territory during Indian Territory days, and it was there that George reared a large family, every one of whom was well-schooled in the activities of Southern Baptists. George was a pastor of a small town and, and country churches in eastern Oklahoma, where most of his children became farmers. The Mauser name is prominent in Baptist affairs in Arkansas, Oklahoma, and in California for more than half a century. The sons and daughters of preacher George Mauser, as he was known to the country folks in Oklahoma, were thrifty Germans, but they were not a match for the boll weevil which destroyed the cotton and the erosion which washed the topsoil off Beaver Mountain, where several of them lived. So one by one they turned their faces toward California. California. Marvin was the first one of the sons to leave his native state. He landed in Shafter, California, December the 18th, 1925. Two years later, his brother Virgil came and joined him. In June 1928, the father came to California after resigning the pastorate of the First Baptist Church in Krebs, Oklahoma. The following year, Henry turned away from the Sooner State and came to seek his fortune in the San Joaquin Valley. Now, Marilyn, you and I, you even go back further than I do. I remember when the San Joaquin Valley, that you come in there and there weren't a lot of uh, highways back then. There were dirt roads, a lot of them. Mm -hmm. And you could see a car coming from one end of the valley to the other. You'd see the dust fall on that car. And you wondered who in the world was coming. Most of the streets downtown were still dirt roads when I was young. They still had horses and wagons going down the roads when I was young selling ice to the people that had ice boxes. They could afford it, <laughs> that is. It cost 50, 50 cents for 50 pounds of ice. 10 cents for 10 pounds, that's a lot of money back then. In the meantime, the daughters and their husbands came west and settled in Shafter. Being staunch Baptists, the Mausers naturally hunted up the Baptist church and most of them joined the first Baptist church in Shafter. Northern Baptist. 
It wasn't long, however, until they discovered that they considered loose observances of the ordinances. They voiced their objections in a quiet and modest Christian manner. However, when Preacher George was invited to fill the puppet, pulpit one Sunday morning, he proceeded to instruct them in the ways of the Lord more perfectly, especially with a reference to the ordinances. We're talking about baptism and the Lord's Supper. Naturally, his sermon was not well received by the church which practiced open communion and received persons with alien conversion. The result was that most of the members of the Mouse and Family gladly withdrew, withdrew from the church and some of their friends who shared their beliefs never did join it. Pulling out of the religious organization with which they found themselves in disagreement by no means satisfied their first for, for fellowship in a fully orthodox Baptist church. Orthodox. Orthodox means straight. Consequently, their thirst for their longing for worship prompted them to get their friends to meet with them for singing and prayer meeting in various homes. Most of the churches started in California were started in preachers' backyards or in their living rooms. That sound familiar? Mm -hmm. Virgil, who had since gone on to, to his reward, got the group together and taught some singing school. Most of the Mousers and many of his friends were good singers. After Virgil died, prayer meetings were often held in the home of his of his widow. By 1931 and 32, meetings were held often in the homes of Archie West and Marvin Mauser. When they met in Marvin's home, services were held in the backyard. 1933 Sunday school was started. And thus the group struggled along and did the best they could to perpetuate their Baptist faith. Now here we go. A church is organized the first missionary Baptist church in the San Joaquin Valley. The first modern missionary Baptist church. The first modern Southern Orthodox missionary Baptist church and independent in California. It was known as the Orthodox Missionary Baptist Church of Shafter. When the name was later printed on the church building, the word independent was added. If that word was included in the name originally, it was left, let the world know that the church was not affiliated with any existing Baptist conventions in California at that time. The organization meeting was moderated by a preacher by the name of John Hardcastle and Dud Pointer. Mm. My family. This comes down to me. <clears throat> a preacher by the name of Joe Hardcastle and Dud G. Pointer was a clerk. Neither Hardcastle nor Pointer became charter members, but Hardcastle served as supply pastor on Sundays, and so did Dud Pointer. The charter members were Mr. and Mrs. Marvin Mauser, Mr. and Mrs. Henry Mauser, Vernon Berlin Mauser, Mr. and Mrs. George Dudger Mauser, Mr. and Mrs. J. Grumbles, Mrs. Tenny Mauser, Mr. and Mrs. Archie West, Velma West, Mr. and Mrs. A. W. Lorimore. You met some of them, Marilyn. You met some of these people. What was the name? Lorimore. And Lorimore, a Lowell Lorimore, making 16 in all. The organization of meeting, Miss Rebecca Mauser, Miss Rachel Mauser, David Grummels were received as candidates for baptism. They wanted scriptural baptism. Scriptural baptism. Real baptism. By the authority of the New Testament Church. Before the ordination meeting adjourned, the church adopted the covenant declaration of faith found in Pendleton Church Manual. Perhaps it should be stated at this point that every one of the charter members was one to Christ and baptized into the fellowship of the Southern Baptist Church, a Southern Missionary Baptist Church. And not one of them had ever belonged to any other kind of church other than cooperating Southern Baptist Church until they came to Shafter, where some of them joined the Northern Baptist Church. At the organization meeting, some of them had their letters 
that those who had joined the Northern Baptist Church didn't ask for letters, but rather came on statement. After a brief intermission, the church assembled, and again, on the evening of the same day in which Mr. and Mrs. R.S. Powell and Mr. and Mrs. G.F. Hendrickson and Guy Mayfield, the Mayfields I know, and Waldina Mayfield were received in the fellowship of the church by letter, and at the same service, Henry Mauser, A.J. Lorimore, G.F. Hendrickson were recognized as active deacons, and they had previously been ordained in Southern Baptist churches. And other business transacted at that evening service elected a building and finance committee composed of Guy Mayfield, G.W. Mauser, A.W. Lorimore, and Henry Mauser. The church held its first baptismal service a week after it was organized, in which time eight persons followed the Lord in baptism. On the following Sunday, the church called Joe Hardcastle as supply pastor, and I was supply pastor for this church for two or three years. They called me their preaching pastor. You remember the tire shop out there? Or they always read my tapes and stuff later on as I was preaching at Valley Baptist Church and took us out to lunch and things, Marilyn. You remember those people? Mm -hmm. Yeah. On the following Sunday, the church called Hardcastle as supply pastor and elected a clerk, a treasurer, a pianist, a choir director, a Sunday school superintendent, and a training union, union director. July or June the 25th, 1936, the church received a deed from Kern County Land Company for three lots for a church building. In a short time, a building was purchased from another denomination and moved onto the property. In the meantime, Hardcastle resigned as supply pastor, and the church called one of its own members, George W. Mauser, to serve as supply pastor. He remained with the congregation until all, August the 15th, 1936, at which time Tom Tom H. Range became the first pastor at a salary of $75 per month. I drove all the way from Bakersfield, California, east side of Bakersfield, all the way to that church every Sunday and preached Sunday morning, Sunday night, mm -hmm. and on Wednesday night. A lot of time I was going to the seminary. I had to drive all the way back to Bakersfield, drive to Bellflower, California, where Glory Gardens Church was, and go to the seminary. And then back I go back the other direction, doing the same thing over and over again. When Reigns resigned, Gene Dodal was asked to fill the pulpit. The pastor was called. The church called Sam Wilcoxon, and I know this. Man, you, Marilyn, you heard Sam Wilcoxon preach one time when we first got married, out there at Taft, in that Taft church. Out there at the Missionary Baptist oh, Church. Where Main, was it? At Taft. He preached there in that church that night one time when we oh. were there. Pastor of Eastside Baptist Church, <clears throat> Paragold, Arkansas, on November 5th, 1937, a salary of $125 a month he accepted and came on the field January the 9th, 1931, and has been the shepherd of the flock ever since. It is significant to note that the first mission offering given by the chapter church was made up on the 13th of December, 1936. We shall see as we go along how often the figure 13 appears in the affairs of the California Southern Baptist. Not long after Samuel Coulson became the pastor, his wife began to interest in ladies' organization of the Women's Missionary Society. This is all in chapter California now. And she and some of the older ladies were members of the church and been active in the, <coughs> the Women's Mission Union work in other days. Her efforts paid off at Women's Missionary Society it was organized April the 6th, 1936. Mr. Wilco Mrs. Wilcoxon was elected president and Mrs. Guy Mauser secretary. This is all in my time now. Mm -hmm. These are people that I knew. A short time after Salvin Wilcoxon came to California, he and his congregation purchased time on Bakersfield radio station in order to broadcast the Southern Baptist message. Now remember, Sam Wilcoxon was a missionary Baptist, a Southern missionary Baptist. For more than a year, the program was broadcast regularly, and much of the benefit of the Southern Baptist came, and that church was still 
on the radio when I came and I preached on them on the radio for them in the 19, early 1970s. His straightforward adultery preaching was heard by hungry Southern Baptists throughout Kern County. Without doubt, his program paved the way for the organization of several other Southern Baptist churches in Kern County. In 1938, there were several landmark churches up and down the state which had secured cooperation of many Southern Baptists, including some which since became staunch supporters of Southern Baptist work. <coughs> I'm sorry, I still got <coughs> trying to get over COVID. And I've been doing pretty good so far. Now these people I know, or I've heard of, rub the elbows with. Roy Young, his mother, and Mrs. W. W. Young, John W. Watson, known in the days as Elder John W. Watson, Silas Hill and J. E. Hill, to name a few. In the meantime, Silas Hill had secured endorsement of some of the landmark churches and was acting as one of their missionaries. Missionary Baptists and Landmarkers worked together this time. One of the missionary journeys, he went to Shafter, probably about February 1938, for a conference with Sam Wilcoxon, in which he made an effort to get Sam to promise that he would try to bring the church into the Landmark Fellowship. Hill insisted that Southern Baptists would never have any organizational work in California and all the real Baptists needed was an avenue of fellowship and cooperation which they could not enjoy in the Northern Baptist Convention. Will Compton refused on the ground that he was a Southern Baptist, but he was a Southern Missionary Baptist. He always preached in Missionary Baptist churches. Never had been anything else, and will never be, but he said, Brother Hill, you can stay over and take up with the church and see if the members want to do it. Independent democracies. Remember, a Baptist church is a democracy. He'll gladly oblige, and when the church was called to Deacon Henry Mouser got up and quietly said, Brethren, it is my belief that we ought to go along and wait until something comes along like we have been used to. That settled the matter, and Shafter never did line up with the landmarks until later, later, a landmark preacher went there and preached, and I'm the one and therefore preserved the unbroken lineage of Southern Baptist cooperation. Sabber, the chapter saints were hungry for shell up and were longing for Southern Baptists to take up <coughs> with landmark reactionaries and Frank Morris radicals. At the same time, other Southern Baptists did join forces with the mountain markers hoping that they could outnumber the radical Bogart element to reform it. The problem with that is Bogard and J.R. Graves brought one thing, Baptist secession, close communion, and no alien immersion. That's the whole problem. I still preach that today. They were never sympathy with the ultra-radical convention hating element and landmark movement. <laughs> they didn't hate the convention, they were part of it. But rather hoped to bring about some sort of cooperation that could be effective in winning millions of lost people to Christ. It said it's a, a regrettable that some of the good Baptists stayed with the landmarks and have never been able to accomplish much for the Master. The only reason why the Southern Baptists began to grow more than the landmarkers is began to, they began to accept alien immersion and open communion. That was the thing. And then when they did that, then they accepted other things, and other things, and other things, and other things in their works. Well, I told you I was going to tell you both sides of the story I have so far, and the story is just beginning in this book. I hope you enjoyed this. I'm a Baptist by conviction. Why I'm a Baptist, and why I'm a missionary Baptist, why I'm a landmark, orthodox, southern missionary Baptist. 
I've been members of Southern Baptist and Missionary Baptist churches all my life, but I've only practiced one, one thing, close communion and scriptural baptism always. Our Father, we send this message out for your honor and glory. Please forgive me where I fail you. Use your message wherever it goes in the world to let people know why we believe what we believe and what the Bible teaches. In Jesus